So we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is, has there been any significant research on black male Trump voters? Um, so black male Trump voters specifically, not so much just yet that I'm aware of, but what we have to realize is that black people supporting the GOP is not new, especially in the more contemporary age, right? Historically and contemporarily speaking, black people on average bend more conservative than they do liberal. There are some really good political scientists that have done work on this. So Teku Lee and Zoltan Hajnal, why Americans don't join the party, Tasha Philpott's work, uh, conservative but not Republican, the Paradox of Party Identification and Ideology Among African Americans, Angela K. Lewis's work, Conservatism in the Black Community to the Right and Misunderstood. Um, in 2016, a Pew Research, uh, a Pew Center survey of validated voters found that 14% of Black men supported Donald Trump. Um, and that of those Black men, sociologist Rayshawn Ray found that many of them were highly educated, they were conservative, and they were religious, but 81% of Black men still supported Hillary Clinton, right? Of course, when you compare that to Black women, we're looking at like 98%. Um, and when we think about what happened in 2020, as far as we can tell from some of the more recent polls, we know that the numbers increased among Black men, I think I've seen anywhere from 18 to 20% in terms of support for uh, Donald Trump. Uh, black women who were in the single digits, like 4% in 2016 um, for Hillary Clinton, now at about 8% in 2020. Um, but, but there is work that Black political scientists have done, that political scientists have done looking at uh, conservatism among Black voters, Black people, and also support of the Republican, of the Republican Party. Um, so that is there. So if anybody's looking to, you know, build some more research upon those things that have already been done. You know, the scholars that I mentioned have have really done a deep dive into this. Okay. Um, Kathy, if, if I just, I just right. wanted to add, put in one more piece about that, that the reason why the question even comes up is because we have a false consensus about Blacks and their voting. We, we tend to over assume that Blacks are monolithic and largely we, we tend to vote along a certain line but the idea that somehow 20% of African-American males supporting someone who's a male like Donald Trump just arises because we tend to have a false consensus about how blacks tend to vote. So that's part of the challenge is having the people at the table to help say, well, that's actually not that, that drastically different a question. We've always seen that, you know, Clarence Thomas or you know, uh, Alan Keyes, we can talk about this kind of thing, but there's a false consensus about how we think about things. And that speaks to the culture of, of surveying, not just polling industry, but surveying. And if I could piggyback off of this too, one question to ask about that is, why is the black GOP candidate vote so stable across time, right? And so if you're getting like one out of every 10, pretty much every presidential election for the last five or so decades, the question might be what's going on with that? That's a different question than why did Trump get X number of black voters? This is a question about what is it about the Republican party that has an enduring appeal to African-Americans? Sorry to jump on that. I just wanted to make sure I chimed in a little bit about that. Okay, thanks. So we, uh, Ronald Eaton says, I'm a black poster and service provider in Washington DC that has serviced nearly 500 black elected officials over the last 10 years. It is likely tougher for non-black pollsters to create surveys that speak to issues in our community and stimulate responses from black voters. So that's his comment. Um, another question is, someone asked about resending the link to the poll. So you need to tell which, because there's one link there to the Roper uh center cornell poll if that's not what you're speaking about please uh type it in the chat um uh, ray can you tell us a bit about turnout and whether that changed 2016 from 2016 to 2020 i can speculate a little bit turnout super high this time around I'm waiting to see what the official results look like, but it looks like both candidates got upwards of 70 million votes. So we're looking at more than 150,000, so like, like, I'm sorry, 
I'm, I'm just going to start over. We're looking at what might be historically high turnout. As a person who has relatives in the deep south, one of the things that my relatives would tell me is that it's not necessarily low turnout. That's the issue, but the mechanisms by which minority votes are diluted, taken for granted, made more difficult to have an impact. Georgia, to me, is one of the examples of how if the dynamics are such that African American mobilization can make dents in those, you know, in those structures, and if the electoral map is favorable to the successes of that, then you could see what are historically red states being blue. The narrative before the election week was that about Texas, but now everybody's looking at Georgia. I would say that the fact that you have large concentrations of African Americans in pockets of the Deep South gives us the opportunity, hopefully, to talk about what it means to not think about the South as being silently red and quote unquote, not worth the effort or worth the combat when it comes to mobilizing democratic candidates and democratic voters. And so as far as turnout changing, I feel like high turnout has something to do with the way things look in 2020. I also believe that things that were in place in Georgia that allowed the black vote to be maximally effective had a lot to do with the outcome too. So it's not just a turnout, but the ability for turnout to translate into outcomes that might be beneficial to candidates, which I think is part of this. If, if I can add one, one piece to it that's relevant to the conversation and that's we won't, so there's turnout in raw number and then there's turnout rate. And we won't know the turnout rate until we get current population or census type data. Uh, what is this? This is 2020. Maybe, maybe there's a, a compendium that's coming out. Hopefully it was done right. We don't know how Trump kind of did the, the census data, but that's how we kind of estimate turnout every election year is by looking at these broader national studies. The exit poll data doesn't really give us that accurate picture of turnout. And again, as I said, with the registered voting data, we don't get race across all the states. So we won't know the actual turnout probably till maybe June, July of next year. And so it's a really interesting question, voting age population versus registered voters turning out. Do we increase registered voters? So a lot of this stuff won't be able to be answered soon, but it's a really interesting uh, and a good time to start asking the question uh, so that we can start doing the right research when the data does come out. Yeah, so David, I think you answered another question in the, uh, that, that is looking forward to seeing turnout among black voters this year compared with uh, 2016. Any early indicators that this panel has seen? So I think you've spoken to that some. I, I, all we have now, honestly, is anecdotes. You could look at, for example, the percentage of Black respondents in exit poll data, but that data is weighted up so that until we get the raw data, we don't actually know what the percentage of respondents is. And of course, the exit poll data constantly is updated as the election returns are in. It's not even, the election is not actually fully done yet. So, um, so, so I think it'll be interesting to see. I mean, turnout was pretty high when Obama won in 2008. And in 2012, for the first time, turnout was higher uh, for African Americans and whites. The question becomes uh, whether or not white turnout decreased a bit uh, this time. Was there split ticket declines? In other words, people just not voting for any presidential candidate, but voting down the ticket for a Senate or, or a congressional candidate. So again, these questions are kind of early to kind of answer with, with some level of accuracy right now, but around middle of next year, uh, we should be able to get closer to it. Okay, so there's a question from another journalist, Peter White. His polls seem to have been biased, but are supposed to be weighted to eliminate errors. So what went wrong? That may be for you, David. That's what I was like, I'm giving it to David. Margin of error guru, got it. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna share this with Ray. Okay, bias and error are two different things. Um, we talk about bias in statistics for, for some things, but in survey, there's only the error that's due to certain things. Error due to uh, sampling, error due to measurement, error due to coverage bias, error due to different sampling frames that might have different modes, uh, modality problems, error due to interviewers, 
error due to random things like Comey announcing an investigation of Hillary Clinton, which is a kind of random error. So response, non-response, measurement, coverage, sampling, all of these things contribute to error. And then the, the most obvious thing is, of course, when you survey people last week to make a prediction about something next week, you should expect there to be error, not just due to sampling, but due to all of those other things I listed, plus random stuff. So the, the, the polls get judged by when they're wrong and get, since they're assumed to be right, because they're scientific, so to speak, they get ignored at their rate of rightness or correctness. If you look at the rate of accuracy in polls this time, they pretty much kick butt. Uh, the ones that didn't get it uh, right happened at the state level, and we could point to all kinds of errors related to methodology, but the larger ones are probably more likely due to the low frequency of polling in the state to understand what's going on, and maybe some issues around you know, accurate data collection, IVR, in-person phone versus mail versus online panels. There's so much going on that to just call every poll the same thing, it doesn't make much sense today. Maybe, maybe in the 70s and 80s, there was just telephone and, and mail and in-person stuff, but now it's just unwieldy. Okay, so there are two questions kind of on our statement and question on Georgia. Uh, why do you think Georgia turned blue this year, but no other southern states with large black populations? I'm thinking about Mississippi and Mike Espy's loss. Why didn't enough black voters turn out so that he could win? So I'm from Georgia six. Um, that's the district that gave us Newt Gingrich uh, in, in the 90s, as well as Lucy McBath more recently. Um, so living that transition and diversity in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia, like in real time. And so one of the things that I think we can't underestimate about this election is the importance of political organizing. Um, and of course, we've talked a great deal about you know, Stacey Abrams and the work that she's done with Fair Vote. But there are so many organizations on the ground, especially in Georgia. Um, uh, Black Voters Matter, La Latasha Brown, um, uh, so many people in the community engagement wing of the NAACP that were doing work, especially in Georgia. Um, and a lot of targeted attention, from what I understand from my friends that are working in these organizations, because of what they saw in that special election with John Ossoff a couple of years ago. And this idea that they were so close in that special election to flipping. And also along with, you know, being very close in the gubernatorial election with Stacey Abrams um, running against Brian Kemp. So doing everything within their power um, to register hundreds of thousands of voters. I think the number that we're coming up with is somewhere over 800,000 um, voter registration. So thinking about, you know, if we duplicate those efforts and put them in other places, like what could that, what could that look like? And so I think that when we're looking at Georgia in the long run, uh, we'll be talking about the importance of political organization and get out the vote efforts and what that means for first time voters, what that means for people that are more inclined to stay home and feel like politics doesn't affect them, the apathetic voters. Um, and so I'm, I'm not aware of, you know, an extensive apparatus like that, especially in Mississippi. Um, that's not to say it doesn't exist. I'm just saying that I'm not, I'm not particularly aware of it. Um, and, and, and thinking in the context of the Doug Jones victory, like why could, I'm sorry, that was Alabama. Um, but like in, in Alabama, when you had the Doug Jones victory for the special election, like why couldn't this happen in a state like Mississippi? I think in the long run, we'll be looking at political organizing. Um, and I would love to see what like a fair vote or a Black Voters Matter, Black Votes Matter, Black Voters Matter, other organizations really getting into Southern states, knocking on doors to see what could happen, uh, just like what happened in Georgia, which was amazing. So I, I'd like to chime in about Mississippi. Yeah. yeah. It's not only hard for a Black person, but it's hard for a Democrat to win a statewide right. uh, election. But they have the, the voters uh, voted in favor of changing the Constitution so that uh, it would increase the chances uh, of Blacks and um, Democrats in general to win in Mississippi. But yeah, along with what Camille said, so. Hey, Professor Golden, I wanna, um, yeah. there was a question that Dr. Penderhughes asked. Yeah, I was getting to that. Okay, go on, shoot. <laughs> okay, so. Um, what I think the competitive advantage is to organizations like Latino Decisions and like the African American Research Collaborative 
is that they combine ground up and top down approaches to survey construction and survey sampling and survey interpretation. So what that means is a typical academic poll, a bunch of people who study the work will get together and create a questionnaire and then go out and give it to people and then collect the results and then do the work. With the African American Research Collaborative, pretty much all of our projects start with community organizers who have interests in certain things to be queried. They'll help us to create the questionnaires and we'll use the connections in communities of color to help us with coming up with the sample that we're going to use and then we'll collect the data and then we'll do the analyses. And so I feel like a lot of this gets back to that cultural sensitivity that needs to be there in the enterprise of polling research. And that's one of the reasons why I really like being part of an organization that takes that into account. Okay, are there big demographic differences across regions in Black turnout by, for example, Black women, Black men, 18 to 25 year olds, et cetera? Don't all answer at, one, at the same time. So I haven't looked at that uh, particularly, David. I don't know if you've been in the APOR data they put together looking at that, but I, I'll have an answer after the holiday break. <laughs> That's what I'll be spending the next six weeks doing, um, digging in that data. I did see some charts online on the internets. I don't know who put these charts together, so I can't say, you know, with a, with a degree of certainty where they're coming from. Um, but I did see something from the state of Georgia about individuals who were between the ages of 18 and 34 um, and their turnout rates. So like thinking about um, both first time voters um, and extremely high turnout rates among black uh, people in that age group in the state of Georgia that were actually among the highest in some of these subgroup categories. But outside of that graph that I saw, who I don't know put it together, <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you much. Um, but we'll be looking at all of that data, you know, for the next few weeks and breaking it down, um, looking by looking at subgroups. So hold on to that question. If you want to email me in January, I, I think I can have an answer for you. Okay, so I'm a black political scientist in South Carolina, Green. What might be, what might you say to the general public of the difference between the Quinnipiac poll that showed Lindsey Graham and Jamie Harrison being neck and neck in the U.S. senatorial race, but the outcome not being neck and neck at all? The, the, the problem with, with those lists of polls, it was Quinnipiac and several others, is that they did not talk about the margin of error for the polls. They just talked about the gap. The gap was usually two points, five points, seven points, but the margin of error for the surveys were usually between three and seven points. And as I, as I tried to express earlier, when you're looking at the difference, in other words, whether or not the difference between two estimates within a question, candidate A and candidate B, when you're trying to see if that difference is significantly different from zero, you double the margin of error. Not always, it depends on the distribution and other things, but you have to double it. So the error for those surveys was anywhere between, in reality, seven and 14 or 15%. And the difference actually turned out to be within that margin. The problem is when you have the media, and that's a part of the art and science piece. The, the, the art piece is understanding that pollsters are collecting the data in the best scientific way they can given the budget that they're given by the sponsor. They give the sponsor the data in the form of what we call top line reports, which are usually just the percentage of A and the percentage of B. And then the media and the journalists take that and create a story around just those top lines. It does not include the error or much about the nuance of the methodology. And that's one of the challenges that we face with using polls to try and predict the future. Now, most people who do this stuff for a living understand this, but the public in general doesn't understand the full scope of the science. And that's, that's a huge challenge in general. Okay, so we have about two minutes and I'll give each panelist 30 seconds to make a closing statement. Okay. 
Oh, you don't want it? Oh, I say presentation order. I was waiting for David. <laughs> uh, if we go in order, just my closing statement is again, I'd encourage you know faculty, graduate students, and anybody who's a professional uh, interested in understanding more about the methodology of surveys and public opinion and doing it within an organization that is really thinking about how to advance uh, diversity in the discipline, the American Association for Public Opinion Researchers has an excellent set of programs that can help. Um, I would say when you're reading polls or when you're getting survey results, don't just read the headline. Right, there's always a little tab or a little hyperlink that says click here for more information. Always click the link um, and go and read about the methodology, read about how the data was collected, read about who's included in the sample. Um, and then, you know, draw some of your own conclusions about what to take away from the surveys. We can all be more informed consumers of surveys. That being said, there are some things that surveys cannot account for, things like voter suppression, right? Like, and so also to be mindful that there are things that there is no way that we can account for in you know, the survey universe. Um, and so to also be cognizant of those things as you are reading the information that you're taking in in these headlines. Hey. I would just say that we should always remember that the enterprise of polling involves people and those people have agency. And so there are academic reasons for why people create these instruments so that they can learn about people's preferences and self-reported decisions, right? There's also the public facing part of what polling research is. In other words, it can inform and be informed by real time discussions about society and politics. All of that should factor into how you understand the results that you get from public opinion polls. And I say that from a perspective of someone who's neutral about the idea that pollsters have agency, because I think that's important, but I feel like it's underappreciated. Sometimes we get these numbers and we focus on the numbers outside of the context from which the numbers were created. Thank you. So uh, thanks to each of the panelists. I'd like to thank you who joined us on a Sunday. I know it's football day, maybe. Uh, <laughs> and, and a big thanks to who will close us out. Sekou for having the foresight and the tenacity to always organize these kinds of sessions. And so my challenge to all of us is to not just talk to each other, but we need to be talking, speaking to people in the community so that they too can understand this polling thing. Sekou? Yes, um, thanks to all the panelists. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, thanks uh, Dr. Golden for moderating this session. Uh, David Wilson, Camille Burge, Ray Block. Um, this, this, these are the best and the brightest in this field, in this area. And I encourage all of the attendees to, to follow them. Hopefully we can get get their uh, their analyses out there more than just listening to some of the stuff that we hear on TV or read on Twitter. So really appreciate it. Um, we're going to circulate this video to all of the attendees and also to the NCOPES community. Um, there's, there's some questions that uh, some individuals may have, so we may circulate them among the panelists. And if, if they can answer those questions, we'll, we'll get them back to the attendees. But again, Thank you for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. This is a great conversation and, and I learned a lot too as well. So um, again, thank you for joining us.